You know, I have forever called Vacation Bible School a marathon week, especially for all the volunteers who have dedicated their time for an entire week to be actively involved with our kids. I'm beginning to think, though, that it's more like the Ironman Triathlon. The kids come each evening very excited, ready to take uh, their step in the, the great jungle journey. Uh, that, uh, and that was our theme all week long, uh, the great jungle journey. They set off on an epic adventure from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, this journey was designed to prepare the kids to survive in today's world. As a matter of fact, our VBS shirts actually read, it's a jungle out there. And you know, it certainly can be at times. Every day our kids, though, are, are bombarded with questions. Did God really create everything? Why do bad things happen? Was Noah's Ark real? Why do I need to be saved? Can I trust in the Bible? You know, I'm sure all of us ask those questions ourselves at times. You know, as the kids sailed along this week through the jungle on a fun jungle cruise amid sloths and butterflies and river dolphins and dart frogs, uh, giant monkeys, um, they each evening had seven ports of call on their, on their sail. Uh, they, they went to games and crafts, food shack, etc. But one port of call every evening was lesson time, a Bible study time, where they learned about the, the seven C's of history, the letter C, creation, corruption, mankind, uh, with a free will, took care of that part, the corruption. And, uh, but you know, God only had a couple other choices, as I see it. He could have just not made us, or he could have made us, but with, not with a free will, like robots, in other words. So God blessed us with life, but we failed and, and fell short. And so, uh, catastrophe was yet another sea that was studied. Of course, that's the, the flood that came as a result of the wickedness of man. Um, every man's heart and thoughts, the thoughts of man was wicked. And then there was confusion. The Tower of Babel, a story for another time, though. But, of course, Christ uh, and the cross and consummation, all things new, a new world in the end. You know, the kids discovered how these events shape our world, and they learned to reconnect the Bible to everyday life. The seven seas of history, basically the gospel message all the way throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Today, being Father's Day, I'd like for us fathers, grandfathers, uncles, and anyone who has influence over our kids to explore some ways uh, to have them hold on to what was taught th this past week. Uh, this might even give you ideas as to how you can survive this jungle. Uh, and so, ladies, this really, this message today is, is relevant for you as well. By the way, I'd like to uh, recognize all the fathers here today. Uh, I'm not going to have you stand up or anything, but I'd just love to give a praise offering for all the fathers. Would you do that? You know, it's such a privilege and honor uh, to teach our children. When Albert Einstein fled Nazi Germany, he came to America and he, he bought an old two-story house within walking distance of Princeton University. There he entertained some of the most distinguished people of his day and discussed with them issues as far-ranging as physics to uh, human rights. But Einstein had another frequent visitor. She was not in the world's eyes an important person like his other guests. She was a 10-year-old girl by the name of Emmy. Emmy heard that a very kind man who knew a lot about mathematics had moved into her neighborhood. Emmy was having trouble with her fifth grade arithmetic. Why not go see Einstein, right? She decided to visit the man down the block and see if he would help her with her problems. Einstein was very willing and explained everything to her so that she could understand it. 
And so we also told her she was welcome to come any time that she needed help. Well, a few weeks, weeks later, a neighbor lady told her mother that Emmy was often seen entering the house of the world-famous uh, physicist. Uh, so horrified, she told her daughter that Einstein was a very important man whose time was very valuable and he couldn't be bothered with the problem of a little schoolgirl. So then the mother rushed over to Einstein's house. Einstein answered the door. She started trying to blurt out an apology for her daughter's intrusion and for being such a bother. But Einstein cut her off and said, she has not been bothering me. When a child finds such a joy in learning, then it's my joy to help her learn. Please don't stop Emmy from coming to me with her school problems. She's welcome in this house anytime, anytime. And you know, as I say, what a privilege it is uh, to be able to teach. Our kids face life struggles uh, just as we do. The more we as parents and caregivers get to know Jesus better, then we can comfort our kids with his love in difficult times. We understand that he is the answer to our disappointments, our doubts, our despair, darkness, and even death. You know, I would say that most of you here have given your life to Jesus. Most of you here would, would likely agree that Jesus is the answer for the struggles and the emotions that uh, we go through in this life. You've experienced it. In other words, Jesus understands each and every one of us. He knows life is hard and that it is often filled with physical and emotional pain. He even sacrificed his very life that we might have an abundant life on earth and eternal life with him, John 10.10. 10. My friends, if we're going to teach our children how to make it through this jungle, the first order of business has to be if you've never done it, is to give your own life to Jesus Christ. That's gotta be the first and foremost thing that you do in the home. Give your life to Jesus Christ. You know, why? Because, you know, if we're going to teach our children uh, how to, to face this jungle in which we live in, we've gotta know ourselves. In Romans chapter eight, verse 37, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Our kids need to know that they can conquer all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we are not commit a committed Christian, the question is how are we going to teach our children right and wrong of Christianity? So the next thing, besides giving your life to Christ, is dedicate your home to the Lord. Dedicate your home to the Lord. Well, what do I mean by that? You may recall after 40 years of disobedience and, and wandering through the desert, Moses called on Joshua to lead God's people into the Holy Land, the Promised Land. Deuteronomy chapter 30, if you'd like to turn there with me, Deuteronomy chapter 30, the last of the five, five books that Moses wrote in the Old Testament, but right up front, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I'd like for us to take a look at verses uh, 15 and 16 of chapter 30. Verses 15 and 16, reading from the word of our Lord. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, his decrees and laws. Then, and hear this, then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. You know, we all know that there are consequences to uh, every action, it's either a good consequence or a bad consequence, depending on uh, w what the action is. And so, the, the, you know, this isn't a, a health and wealth type of a, a message here at all, but it, but it is just the fact that 
when we obey God's commands, uh, things go better for us. Not that we are exempt from suffering, but the scripture says, then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering and possess. And I'm sure many of you have experienced God's blessings in your life. After Moses dies, Joshua leads the people in conquest and gets them established in the land, the promised land. And then as his death approached, Joshua called Israel uh, together once again uh, to challenge them to renew the covenant and confirm their willingness to serve the Lord. Just like Moses, he offers them a choice that they must serve God or serve the gods of their founding nations. Uh, either way, Joshua said that they will reap the consequences of their choice. So Joshua expresses his personal uh, commitment to the Lord, a text that I'm sure um, most all of you are familiar with in Joshua chapter 24. If you're not sure of the address, I know you've heard it uh, a few times anyway. But Joshua 24 and 15 reads, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. You know, at home, uh, we've got a good sized doormat at our front door that says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, we know that the doormat won't save us, but we do know the man who can. And it also serves a reminder to anyone who, who comes in that this house belongs to the Lord. So let your kids see you uh, also in the word of God. Let your kids see you in the word of God, and that's on your outline as well. You know, if you happen to be walking through the rural village of Epworth, England, back in the early 1700s, uh, on any given day, and you happen as you were walking down this uh, sidewalk, and uh, many of the homes are right there on the sidewalk, but as you're walking down uh, and you peered through the window of the home of the a preacher of the local Anglican church, you might have caught sight of something that might seem a little strange. Depending on the time of day, you might have seen a woman sitting in a chair with her kitchen apron pulled up over her head while 10 children read, studied, or played around that area. You know, two of those 10 children would have been little boys, uh, John and Charles, who would grow up to shape the course of Christian history and help to change the world. The woman under the apron would have been Susanna Wesley, mother of John, and Charles Wesley. Susanna Wesley assumed this odd position for two hours almost every day. Why did Susanna lean so heavily on the Lord? Well, let me explain. Susanna understood the dynamics of large families. She was born the 25th uh, of 25 children. How would you like to be the bottom on that list? That was in 1669. Susanna grew up the daughter of a prominent, highly educated minister in cosmopolitan London. She had little formal education, but growing up in an academic household with so many older siblings, she was well-read and well-rounded intellectually. She met Samuel Wesley, an aspiring Anglican minister, and they married in 1688 when she was 19 years old. Susanna remaining 53 years, her remaining 53 years were far from easy ones. They were characterized by loss, hardship, and struggle. Yet she became a woman of immense legacy, largely through the dual virtues of organization and prayer. She would organize prayer groups and the like, and a very organized lady herself. I mean, she delivered 19 children, but nine, including two sets of twins, died in infancy. 
Another was accidentally smothered in the night by a nurse as Susanna recovered from labor and delivery. You know, we never know when or what kind of struggles might come our way, but it does us well to prepare through prayer, Bible study, all in all developing a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, let me talk just a little bit more about a minute about Susanna Wesley. She took her relationship to God as seriously as she did her duties as a wife and a mother. Early in her life, she vowed that she would never spend more time in leisure entertainment than she did in prayer and Bible study. And even amid the most complex and busy years of her life as a mother, she still scheduled two hours each day for fellowship with God and time in his word. And she adhered to that schedule faithfully. You know, the challenge was, was finding a place of privacy in a house filled to overflowing with children. Mother Wesley's solution to this was to bring the Bible to her favorite chair and throw her long apron up over her head, forming a sort of a, a tent, if you will. And this became something akin to the tent of meeting in the tabernacle in the days of Moses in the Old Testament. Every person in the household from the littlest to the oldest, even the helpers in the house, they knew well to respect that signal. No one disturbs. When Susanna was under the apron, she was with God and was not to be disturbed except in the case of direst emergency. There in the privacy of her little tent, she interceded for her husband and children and plumbed the deep mysteries of God in the scriptures. The holy discipline equipped her with a thorough and proud, profound rather, I'm sorry, knowledge of the Bible. You know, all we have to do is just take God's word in and allow through the Holy Spirit that word to change our lives to change our lives to where we become more like Christ each day. An example to those that we come in contact with, especially our children. You might ask, how do I get into the Word of God? What's, what's the secret? Well, just ask for the Holy Spirit's help. First, begin your time by approaching God in prayer. And then read a portion of scripture, let's say about five or ten minutes, okay? Meditate on what you've read for another five or ten minutes. And then pray over what you've read five to ten minutes. And lastly, take the passage with you throughout the day until it kind of becomes your own. Now, over time, you may want to bring it up a notch. If possible, by intentional, be intentional about planning a time and a place. Uh, bring a notebook and a pen and reflect on what you've read and then write it in a journal. You can start keeping a journal and see how God moves in your life. You know, if these things are in place, it will drastically improve your time in God's word. Everything you do or say you should do or say without, with Christ in mind. And that comes from quieting yourself, if you will, before the Lord and letting the Spirit continuously speak to your hearts. First Kings, if you would please, if you care to go there. Go to 1 Kings chapter 19. I'd like to, for us to take a look at verses 11 through 13. Reading from the word of our Lord. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. 
but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. God often speaks in a gentle whisper. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, God says, Be still and know that I am God. This is a, all of this that I've mentioned as far as your study of God's word is in preparation for what? Well, it's in preparation for teaching your children the word of God. That's so important. Teaching your children the word of God. Going back to Deuteronomy and that fifth book back in the Old Testament, chapter 6. Verses 1 through 10, Deuteronomy chapter 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Verse 3, hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your hearts and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses, on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. We are to teach our children constantly. You know, since ancient times, Jews had practiced this tradition. You saw in our text where they talked about binding on their foreheads the word of God. There were these phylacteries that they used, and, and, and there, they were small leather boxes, and they would tie them around their wrists, or they tie them, bind them around their foreheads so that the scripture was always with them. That, that's what the box contained. Uh, portions of the laws of Moses. And uh, the thing is, the Pharisees in, in time uh, basically made them a display of being holier than thou. So the idea kind of faded. Why? Uh, because what's important is for the word of God to move from the head to the heart because that's where we change. That's where we change. And when God repeats something, he, he's putting extra emphasis on what it is that's being said. If you're still in Deuteronomy, I'm going back here to chapter 11. Uh, when I talk about God repeating something, he's putting an emphasis on it. Chapter 11, verse 18. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land of the Lord, that he swore to give your ancestors as many as the days that 
the heavens are above the earth. I'm, I'm going to ask the praise team to begin to make their way forward. The praise team's probably asleep because I, they'll, be, they'll be all right. I'm cutting it just a tad bit short this morning. Um, just because I thought I'd be nice. I will, Danny. Thank you. Um, I guess this is our praise team coming forward. Is that right? How important is it for us to teach our children about our faith? So that the days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many of the days that the heavens are above the earth. You know, Psalm 127 and 5 reads like this Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate. And I'd say by looking around here, there are many of you who have full quivers. But a good father lives his faith in God, a faith that is heard and seen by his children. A good father, his knees are calloused from the time spent in prayer. A good father worships weekly with his family, and a good father is not perfect, but he is perfectly forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Won't you pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you for our day today. And Thank you for the many blessings that you bring our way. And Lord, uh, as we begin to close out our service, we pray that you would just continue to watch over us, put a burning within our hearts, Lord, uh, a desire, a thirst, and a hunger to know you better each and every day. Let this be our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>